The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own home, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In the last few chapters of Mark's Gospel, Jesus has been moving from one success to another in his ministry. There was the stilling of the storm and the healing of the demon-possessed man. And before Jesus restored Jairus' daughter to life, the woman with the issue of blood was healed by touching the hem of his clothes. Things were going pretty well for Jesus. In today's gospel, we heard that Jesus made his way to his hometown with his disciples in tow. As was the custom of Jesus on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was invited to teach since he was recognized as a rabbi. As is typical in Mark's gospel, we are not given many details, and so we aren't told what Jesus preached. But if we go to another gospel like Luke chapter 4, we learn that what Jesus proclaimed was a messianic prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus unrolled and read from the scroll. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for all captives and to release from darkness, for, release from darkness the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on, bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Afterward, the, t re the villagers reacted the same way to his teaching as other audiences. They were astonished at his wisdom and authority. But in this case, it was not a positive astonishment at all. We are told that his words offended them. And when we read that the crowd was offended at him, it's not just because he had a supernatural ability to heal people. It's 100% because he is claiming to be their Messiah. And that seems really weird for them. In their minds, Jesus is just one of the hometown boys they've known all their lives. And to this point, they have never seen anything extraordinary about him. To them, he's just a carpenter's son. Where did this man get all these things? Where did he learn all this? How is he doing all these miracles? Isn't this Mary's son? They ask. Their questions reveal their skepticism. They have pigeonholed Jesus as if they know all there is to know about him. The idea that, a hometown, car that hometown carpenter Jesus could be inaugurating the kingdom of God was scandalous. And it did not conform to their preconceived ideas about how God could and would act. From their perspective, Jesus' hands would be put to better use by returning to his former occupation as a carpenter and making tables and chairs instead of attracting crowds of sick people and angering the religious leaders. 
So in a place where one might expect Jesus to receive the warmest welcome, his home, he was met with rejection. And this was actually the third time that Jesus experienced rejection in his ministry. Just three chapters earlier in Mark 3, his family had labeled him crazy and tried to restrain him. And at a later time, his mother and siblings tried to remove him from his teaching ministry. Jesus, the Son of God, suffered misunderstanding and rejection from those closest to him, and on a wider scale, his people. So we can imagine that the response he received from his friends and family was difficult and painful for him. And this reveals his humanity to us. But the good news that I have the joy of proclaiming today is that Jesus modeled wisdom as he navigated difficulties that arose. And he invites us to recognize our need for the continued revelation of God's wisdom so that we might navigate life in this difficult world without being overcome. During my visit to Uganda in May, we visited the headquarters and cathedral of the Church of Uganda, which, by the way, is what the Anglican Church is called there, the Church of Uganda. Can you imagine the Anglican Church in the the USA being called the Church of America? I digress. Anyway, this is where I met the esteemed and honorable Archbishop Samuel Stephen Kazimba. I was fascinated to learn that Kazimba was born the son of a polygamist. For reasons untold, but perhaps because a new wife came into the picture, his father separated from his mother and sent a very young Kazimba away with her. From that point on, Kazimba and his mother struggled to survive. Life was difficult, to say the least. Kazimba faced rejection over and over, not only from his biological father, but from society. Fast forward many years to March of 2020, when he was elected as the new Archbishop of Kampala, It is said that Kazimba's installation as the ninth archbishop took many by surprise. Those who knew him said it was inconceivable that someone with a poverty-stricken and troubled upbringing like his could be entrusted with the highest clerical office in the Anglican ecclesiastical province. People pigeonhole the archbishop into that little poverty-stricken, troublesome boy he once was. And he could have let that rejection set in and fester like a wound. He could have allowed that rejection to define him. But he looked to those who had clawed their way out of poverty and sought their help, like from his uncle who harvested bananas and taught Kazimba the trade. Kazimba chose a different path that led to somewhere unexpected. The good news is that Jesus modeled wisdom as he navigated difficulties that arose, and he invites us to recognize our need for the continued revelation of God's wisdom so that we might navigate life in this world without being overcome. One way Jesus made sense of this inflection of rejection was to link himself with the Old Testament prophets who also suffered rejection or violence because of their unpopular message. Reaching back into his mental encyclopedia, verse 4 says he recalled the wisdom he was taught from the scriptures, similar to those we read today in our first reading, where God told the prophet Ezekiel what to do when the people of Israel refused to hear the message God speaks through him. God told Ezekiel, don't be afraid of them or of their words or of their looks. Speak my words to them, whether they hear you or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. Nevertheless, regardless of the reception you receive, you are called to be faithful to speak the message the Lord has given you. Ezekiel was a prophet without honor, 
No one wanted to hear what he had to say, but God had prepared him for their cold shoulder reception. So Jesus quoted this rejection wisdom about a prophet not being welcome in his own town, among his relatives, or in his home for his own sake. Jesus relied on the Spirit, teaching him through the scriptures to navigate this earthly life so that when he faced rejection, like in this account we heard today, but also during his passion, knowing and secure in his identity in God, he was not surprised, for he was drawing on the wisdom of those who had gone before, them, before him. Although, just because God specially equipped Jesus with wisdom to traverse the inevitable challenges of the world doesn't mean he didn't feel grief or thought it was a breeze to handle. Yet, even as he faced rejection, Jesus was able to move on from this interaction with his family and friends without being overcome and continue on with his ministry. But when Jesus discloses this wisdom in front of his disciples in verse 4, he was not only providing insight into how he was processing this hurtful and difficult experience, he was stating it for their benefit. Because of the way this particular wisdom would be of benefit for the mission he was giving them. Now the disciples wouldn't be nearly as surprised or taken off guard when they experienced rejection for ministering in Jesus' name. And they'd be more capable of both navigating it well and moving through the hurt and pain from it. So Jesus was providing them with practical experience in ministry to prepare them for the day when the work would be in their hands. And the good news is that Jesus modeled this wisdom as he navigated difficulties that arose, and he invites us to recognize our need for the continued revelation of God's wisdom so that we might navigate life in this difficult world without being overcome. Even though we will not necessarily face the same challenges in our lives that Jesus or his disciples did, we can be sure that our lives will contain no shortage of unique difficulties, difficulties to navigate and grieve. And more good news for us today is that just as Jesus did for his disciples, Jesus is similarly ready to give us the wisdom we need. The truth is, life in this world is challenging and Jesus does not pretend otherwise. But it is essential that we recognize our need for his wisdom so that we aren't surprised or fall away in our unique difficulties that we will encounter or are even encountering now. So how do we gain wisdom? A good place to start is being open to seeking wisdom and sharing your life with people who discern are wise. Not in a worldly sense, but wise in the Lord. And ideally, gaining wisdom is something that comes from being fed with the word on Sunday. One of Father John and my major responsibilities in standing in this pulpit is, try, is to try to impart wisdom. So by you even being here, you're showing good faith of wanting wisdom, but all the more reason for you to pray for Father John and me. It's not that we have the market cornered on wisdom, but because we are in this world, this role, imparting wisdom is a task we've been given. And we need God's help to impart this wisdom his wisdom, which is ultimately cultivated from our own walk with Jesus. We are his vessels, and wisdom is greatly needed. And so pray for us, that the Holy Spirit would communicate and help us speak through us, and, and speak through us, and not only that he would give us wisdom to impart, but that he would help us to make what we teach and preach 
digestible. Pray for the Spirit to work through our faltering, wor faltering words and imperfect actions so that God is revealed. And pray for the Spirit to do that in this place and to make the pursuit of wisdom the culture of this parish. Amen.